Um, anyway, I'm very pleased to say we have um, Mitch Holton with us. Um, music is a wonderful thing, unless you've tried the synth on the badges, in which case your neighbours may not agree. Um, but I'm happy to say that it's going to sound a lot better with what he's doing today, which is the Ardu Touch music synthesizer. Thanks so much, Mitch. Thank you. Great. So, um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, the contact information on the screen is real. Please feel free to contact me anytime for any reason. I'm totally happy to answer questions about the, this project, but also about really anything you might uh, feel I can help with. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, I've been <laughs> giving workshops. My voice is not so good, but bear with me. Uh, I go around the world and giving workshops and talks, and I love uh, doing workshops and talks. Uh, I give little ones and big ones. Uh, I teach soldering, and um, I like teaching soldering. When people come together and solder, everyone just seems to be happy. I mean, like, they look happy, right? <clears throat> This is what it looked like over in the hardware hacking area um, all the last three days. And we've got a few more hours. If anyone wants to come by until they kick us out, feel free. Um, <clears throat> I wrote a comic book about it. Like everything I do, it's open source. You can download this, and it's in lots of different languages. Um, all the kits I make are open source. Uh, my first kit was TV Be Gone kit. That's how I make a living with TV Be Gone keychains, and uh, yeah, sold like 600 some thousand of these, and me and 12 friends have made a living on it for the last 12 years, it's amazing. Um, and uh, doing the kits, I don't make any money from that, but, um, but as long as people want them, I'll make them available. These are just some of the kits that I have. My latest kit is the Arju Touch Music Synthesizer Kit, which has been extremely popular. Uh, I, had the first early version uh, about two years ago, but the, the hardware is super simple. This board has a Ardu uh, Arduino in the corner with a chip and uh, just a handful of parts. It's an Arduino Uno. And there's a little audio amp in the corner with a speaker. And the bottom half is just a keyboard, a touch keyboard, uh, and a couple of knobs and a couple of buttons. So the hardware is quite simple, and I call it Ardu Touch because it's uh, an Arduino with a touch keyboard. Uh, not a great name, but whatever, you get the idea. And um, in the last two and a half years, I've been working on the firmware, the controlling uh, program, and that's the hard part. Uh, and I'll talk about some of that. It's just some pictures of workshops I've been doing over the last couple of years with the earlier version. Uh, it's totally mature now though, and, uh, but it's still a work in progress. I'm still making it a lot better, uh, along with the help of my friend Bill Alessi, who's a brilliant firmware engineer. So uh, my motivation for doing Ardu Touch was to make something that uh, makes sound. You can learn to solder with it, you put it together, and it just works, and then it makes a cool synthesizer, because I didn't really see many kits um, that make really cool sound and music and noise, and I like sound and music and noise. Uh, noise is great. Uh, so when you make this, it just works. And it's easy to debug if it doesn't, because it's a simple kit as far as the hardware goes. And uh, if you want to, you can learn a little bit about uh, Arduino, or if you already know about Arduino, then you can reprogram it to use any of my synthesizers and reprogram it to some way cool variety of different music sound and noise. And if you want to learn even more, then you can read the documentation and follow some examples and learn to make your own synthesizers. And if you want to learn even more, then you can read my documentation, which I'm improving all the time to learn digital signal processing, which is a fancy phrase for how to manipulate things with a computer to do cool things in the world. So here's just uh, one uh, demo video. This is the one it comes with. It's called Thick. It's for sawtooth waves. And you can manipulate it and make a variety of different sounds with portamento gliding between notes and a couple sounds otherwise. 
kind of cool. And this is what hap- what you hear when you build the Arju Touch, and it just works. It's fun. But just to put this in some context, um, not that my project matches up to these other people's, but uh, I've been fascinated with electronic music all my life, and people have been playing with electronic music for a long, long time. One of the earlier people who's one of my musical heroes is um, Theremin. He made the thing which is best known for really bad Hollywood sci-fi movies, or the original season, uh, first season of Star Trek, uh, with a human-like voice going, Ooh. that's a theremin. And um, when I went to university, it turned out that my advisor, one of my advisors, uh, had been playing with music synthesis since he was a kid, and um, the black and white photo is his uh, PhD thesis. It's a whole bunch of oscillators that mix together to make lots of super interesting noises. And I was just at the University of Illinois as hacker in residence earlier this year and met up with him. And there he is looking a bit um, uh, older than when I remember him as an advisor, but he's still doing great. And here he's playing an emulator of his original synthesizer that was from 1964. Um, As a little kid, I was fascinated with switched on Bach. Uh, by then Walter, uh, now Wendy Carlos, and like, wouldn't it be cool to have a wall of things like that that you could plug things into and whatever? So uh, Switched on Bach was one of my favorite records as a kid, and uh, when it started becoming part of all rock and roll music, I had another musical hero with Keith Emerson. He could even play this synthesizer upside down on a stage. Uh, kind of acrobatics, but it was fun. And um, uh, later in the 70s was the first one you could actually buy for affordable. This was like 80 bucks in the US. And it made cheesy sounds, but it was you could buy it and it worked. And later there was one uh, that, was, um, that I got used uh, that made all sorts of crazy noises, the DX, uh, DX7. Oh, that uh, caption's wrong. That's a DX7 by Yamaha. And uh, I've been making synthesizers since I was in middle school, simple ones, and then through high school getting more and more complex, and it turned into my master's thesis to have a digital synthesizer. And <clears throat> that cost a lot of money, but our lab had a um, million dollars worth of microcontrollers that were donated by Intel, which helped me in my music uh, quite a bit. Uh, now it's much easier to do things, and um, the RG Touch Music synthesizer is just 30 bucks, and um, US, and it's really easy to play with. You don't have to study manuals for months and months like a DX7. Uh, music synthesis um, has two major kinds of approaches. There's analog and there's digital. And analog is, uh, like in the real world, everything's analog. Everything's smooth, everything's connected to everything else. There aren't major jumps unless you're talking about quantum and really, really small or really, really big things, much bigger than our day-to-day lives or much smaller. But in our real world, it's all analog. And doing digital means you've got to muck with the analog world, get it into a digital form, and then muck with it some more to make interesting things happen, and then turn it back into analog. And there's a lot available nowadays. These people, uh, teenage engineering, um, make lots of interesting little modules that do fantastic things, and they're super inexpensive. And there's also, of course, fantastic performing musical instruments that are still analog and digital. Analog, I still think, is, is the greatest. But you can do so much with digital um, on your own that's hard to do with analog on your own. So with analog, quite often it's some, just some simple waveforms these smooth up and down called a sine wave, uh, just on off, on off, on off, the square wave, um, the triangle wave, or a sawtooth wave, which is shaped like uh, teeth of a saw, which is why it's called that. And they all have different sounds, and they're all interesting. And if you mix them together in different combinations and different pitches, and then muck with it in certain ways with filters, you can get amazing sounds and, and great noise. So uh, with digital, 
You can try to just emulate an analog synthesizer like the old Mini Moog, uh, which actually had a Mini Mo uh, a, a roommate in university who had a Mini Moog, and we made lots of sounds and annoyed the hell out of our neighbors, uh, which is always a fun thing to do. But with digital, you can uh, emulate an analog synthesizer. It'll never be quite as good, but you can get quite quite good. But with digital, you've got to take whatever's in the real world. Break it up into little bits, because that's what computers use, is bits, bytes, words, and then mess with it in certain ways, either through calculations or real time with knobs and buttons. Um, and you can use all sorts of interesting math to muck with it as well, and then put it back together again to put it out into our world where you can hear music, sound, and noise. And to do that, digital signal processing really, really helps, uh, that fancy phrase. But it's really not that difficult to be able to play with this stuff, and I'll talk about that. There's various forms of digital synthesis, and my RG Touch Music Synthesizer makes use of all of these. Um, the easiest one to talk about uh, is coming later, but uh, additive is a really interesting way to make sounds, and my advisor from the University of Illinois back in 64 did additive synthesis to create all the sounds he makes with his gear, uh, it's just a bunch of sine waves. Some dead French mathematician named Fourier figured this out. If you have a bunch of sine waves at different volume, amplitude, and different frequencies and add them together, you can add them together to make any shape waveform you want. And here's just a few pictures which show how to add a few sine waves together to get a square wave. If you do 13 of them, it's pretty much indistinguishable from a square wave. Here we just have uh, four of them showing how to get uh, really close to a square wave. We can also have FM. Uh, FM is a sine wave, a frequency that, uh, a sine wave where the frequency is changing over time and uh, it's a sine of a sine function. And this is what the DX7 used very effectively in the first very popular FM synthesizer. And this makes just totally nutty sounds, it, but it can make really beautiful sounds well, as well, like a bell or a trumpet uh, that was very difficult to do earlier with um, analog synthesizers. But um, to get into this form wavetable, um, you can think about a tape loop. So it's tape loop, um, it's kind of like with a vinyl record, old vinyl records. If you turn the motor off and you can spin it with your finger, you can make it go slow or fast, and people who scratch make use of this. They also go backwards. The sound is recorded in the grooves of the record. Uh, in a tape loop, though, the sound's recorded in a continuous loop of sound and you can make it go faster, you can make it go slower with a motor controller, um, and you can, if you have a record head, you can put new sounds into it, and it just repeats and repeats. And a wavetable is kind of like that, except the sound is put into a form uh, that a computer can understand, digitized, and then we can play it back from memory, faster, slower, but we can also do lots and lots of things that are more difficult to do with a tape loop, like do mathematical formulas on it and all sorts of interesting filtering techniques and muck with it in lots of ways. For digital, we start off usually with the analog world and then convert that into a form computers understand. So we can take just a simple sine wave. Here's one cycle of a sine wave. And to make it into a form that a computer can understand, we've got to slice it up into chunks. Um, this is called sampling. That's the fancy digital signal processing word, sampling. So here I cut up uh, a sine wave into 10 slices. And each slice has a value. We can put a dot where it crosses the waveform, and each of those dots has a value. We can put the values on like this, and then record those values in a table. Uh, it can be a piece of paper, that's not so useful, but if it's memory, now we have it in a computer where we can use it and muck with it and do all sorts of interesting things with that. So this is a sampled sine waves with 10 samples. Um, usually we use much more, and I'll show you why soon. 
So these samples are stored in memory. It can be a simple one waveform, but it can also be a very complex waveform that's several seconds or even longer. Like this is um, a, sort of a simplified version of a piano-like sound, part of a piano-like sound. And those values are stored in, in memory. In order to get from a waveform in our real world, the analog world, into memory, that process is called uh, analog to digital conversion. And here's a little diagram of that. We can take the waveform, put it through an analog to digital converter, that's just a black box, and then out comes values that are stored in memory. Um, people in the field call this A slash D, A to D conversion. Um, but how do you do that? What is that black box? Well, um, that black box can be a chip, and uh, see how all that works would take more than I can go over in this talk. Um, but it's not all that bad. But if you buy the chip, you can just set it up uh, according to the, um, the schematic in the uh, data sheet, and it just works. Um, but nowadays, even inexpensive microcontrollers have them built in, and they, so they're basically free. And um, uh, once you uh, have it, you probably want to play it back. You won't want to play it back exactly as it is, or you might want to muck with it first and then play it back. But in order to do that, you do the opposite, and that's digital to analog conversion. So it's just the same thing but reversed. We have a different black box now called digital to analog converter. And um, out comes the waveform, ideally. And then from there, you can put it into a, an amplifier and rock and roll. So that's the idea. <clears throat> so D slash A is the, the, the fancy professional way of saying it, but um, that's really what it is. And so what's in this black box? Well, again, you can have a, a chip, which is really expensive, actually, to get a good one, uh, or you can use PWM. And I'll say what PWM actually means after I go through, through a few more slides so you can understand that. Uh, PWM works with basically square waves. So a square wave, though, is on, off, on, off, on, off. And it's half on, half the time it's on, half off. Same time on, off, on, off, on, off. And so with a, a square wave, it's basically half the amount of energy of if it's on all the time, because it's off half the time as well. Rather than have just square, where it's 50% on, 50% off, we can have different ratios of on-off time. Um, like a pulse wave, and analog synthesizers make use of pulse waves just to make interesting sounds as well. Uh, but here's one that's 25% on and 75% off. And that ratio is called a duty cycle. So 25%, uh, that means there's 25% of the energy coming out compared to just on all the time. And we can have various ratios. It doesn't have to be even numbers either. It can be a uh, uh, fixed point down to as many decimal places as you want. It can be on for uh, 37.4644, whatever. It can be any value. And you can vary the amount of energy coming out by varying the width of these pulses. And when you vary the width, uh, when you change something over time in electronics, that's called modulating it. And what we're modulating here, changing over time, is the width of the pulse wave. So, oops, pulse width modulation, PWM. And this is the way that you can make uh, all sorts of amazingly beautiful and nasty noises out of a microcontroller. And um, it's free because all microcontrollers have output pins. And many of them have timers which are designed for PWM, make it easy for you. So the same diagram before, except the black box is labeled PWM. So we have values in memory. We feed the first value into our D to A converter, digital to analog converter. Out comes the first little bit of our waveform, then feed it the next memory location. Out comes the next part. And you go through the whole table byte by byte or word by word, and out comes the waveform. And uh, you can put in an amplifier and rock and roll, and it's totally cool. You can make really cool, nasty, and wonderful, and beautiful sound music and noise. So that's the theory. 
In practice, however, there's a bunch of gotchas. So um, this is what we want. We want a table full of values, that's our waveform in digital computer form, feed it through our black box digital to analog converter, and out comes a perfect waveform, in this case a sine wave. In actuality, however, we get this. Because computers don't have all the values in between, we only have samples. Each memory location is just one point of the waveform, and that value stays there till you put the next point in, and the next point, and the next point, and this sounds nasty. That might be a good thing, but if you don't want that, you want it to be a nice, smooth, wonderful sine wave, you're out of luck. So in order to fix that, um, according to theory, all we need is a perfect low-pass filter. A low-pass filter uh, lets low pitches through, but not high. A perfect one, you pick a frequency, everything below comes out perfect, everything above doesn't come out at all. And if you have a perfect one of those, then you get a perfect sine wave out. But of course, perfect doesn't exist in our real world. Um, but we can use a really uh, cheap one. So perfect doesn't exist, but we can use a really cheap low-pass filter, which on my RG Touch is just one capacitor and one resistor for each channel, and I've got two channels, it's stereo. Um, and from this, if you put it through my cheap low-pass filter, you don't get a perfect sine wave out, you get this kind of messy-ish sine wave out. And that actually sounds okay-ish. To fix that, what we do is we have more than 10 samples for a waveform. We have like 256. And if you have 256 with this cheap one, you get pretty much a perfect sine wave out. Not quite. Our ear is more sensitive than our eyes. It looks like a perfect sine wave, but it sounds a little bit scratchy. Um, but I pull some other tricks and some waveforms that I want it to be really smooth, I have way more values than 256. It also helps if the values are more than eight bits. If the values are 16-bit words or even 32-bit words rather than 8-bit bytes, then the values are um, much more accurate. So that's really all there is to it to get um, uh, from the analog world to computerese, and then from computerese into the analog, uh, the, back to the analog world where we can make music. But that's just showing how to get the waveform what we really want to do is change the pitch a lot, because we're playing a keyboard or playing with a breath controller or all sorts of things, or just with knobs, we want to get all sorts of frequencies, lots of different pitches to make crazy sounds and music and uh, all sorts of things. So how do you get different pitches? Well, uh, in order to explain this, I'm afraid I've got to do a little bit of maths. Um, hope that's okay. Sorry about that. Um, it's cool math. So um, if we have 256 memory locations to describe a waveform, and we send one value out at a time to the digital to analog converter, and out comes our waveform, what is the frequency of it? Well, we, if we send one every second, then we can have the complete waveform in 256 seconds. That is way too slow for human hearing. For human hearing, we've got to have a 20th of a second minimum to do a waveform, and that's a really, really low note. And we want all the way up to a 20,000th of a second. So um, one hertz, uh, that's the way of saying one per second, um, isn't fast enough. And this, again, is called the sample rate, the rate at which we play the memory locations to, through our D to A converter to get the sound out. So let's, uh, instead of one second, in the RG Touch I use um, 15,000, oh, already went over that, we use 15,000 samples per second, 15 kilohertz sample rate. And when we do that, we can get much more interesting things, but still it's rather limited. If we just do the 256 samples, in our memory and play them one at a time 15,000th of a second later, we get 15,000 divided by 256 memory location samples and we get 58.6 hertz, 58.6 cycles per second. That is 
um, basically uh, the frequency we get out, and that is a pitch near A sharp, the lowest A sharp on the keyboard. That's not a very useful pitch, especially if it's the only pitch we can make. No one else can play with us unless they go off tune on a violin or a slide flute. Um, so what we want to do is get any pitch we want. If you have a keyboard, you want to get every note on the keyboard. If you have a knob, you want to get every sound you can hear in hum range of human hearing 20 times a second to 20,000 times a second. So we can do that in two ways. One way is really hard, and that's like a tape loop. Change the speed of the tape going around or change the rate of all of the memory locations, feeding them in the D to A converter faster or slower. We can only get 58.6 hertz max, so that's not really a good way to do it. And um, slowing it down is complicated in code. So the one way to do it is to skip memory locations. And if we skip them, then we can get a faster sounding, uh, we can get a higher sounding pitch. Uh, and skipping them is, is in quotes because what we're really gonna call that is interpolating. And let me show you how that works. So let's say we want an A, and in music, A440 is defined as 440.000000 times a second hertz. That's the definition of A, middle A on a keyboard, uh, and in all instruments. And so um, if we want to get 440 hertz and we've got samples coming out every 15,000th of a second, we divide 440 into that and we get 34.09 steps. So that means we skip 34.09 memory locations every time we do a, uh, an output of a sample. How do you get a .09 memory location? Well, you can't. You have location zero, one, two, three, only integers. You can't go to location one and a half. That doesn't exist, or 34.09, that doesn't exist. But we can interpolate between location 34 and location 35. So we'll skip 34.09 every sample. And let me, I have some pictures to show how that works. So we start off with just the first one, location zero, and whatever value's in there goes into our D to A converter, and that's the first slice of our waveform. Then we go to location 34.09. We can't do that, but we can go to some weighted value between location 34 and 35. It'll be really close to the value in 34. And then we add 34.09 to that to get 68.18. And then we have another weighted value between 68 and 69. And then we get to the next one, 102.27, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the seventh value, we get 238.68. It's still in our table. But the next one, it will go un below the, um, the memory locations that we have. So we wrap around to the top. So this would have been 272.72, but we wrap around by subtracting 256 from it, and now we're back in our table, and now we have location 16.72, a weighted value between 16 and 17. And we just keep going around and around and around, and we do that at that rate, and out comes a perfect waveform at, through our cheap low-pass filter uh, at 440 hertz. A, middle A on the keyboard. And it can be the sound of a, a normal piano, it can be a sound of a sine wave, a square wave, a violin-like sound, a trumpet sound, whatever. It just depends what's stored in the memory. And um, that's really all there is to it. To do it, you know, conceptually, you know, maybe you didn't follow all that absolutely perfect, but hopefully you have a feel for what I went through. And uh, to code that is, um, kind of complicated, but I already did it. And uh, if you wanna hack on my code, feel free, it's totally open source. But I made it really easy by putting all that low level stuff in a file and uh, having all of these functions in an Arduino library so that no one really has to do that unless they want to hack on my code. And feel free, and if you come up with something cool, let me know, because I'll share it with other people then. Um, but my RG Touch makes it really easy to do all these things. 
Uh, and that's part of the idea, uh, to make it easy on the highest level, but make it so that it's totally hackable so people can do all sorts of more interesting things that I've come up, that I've come up with. So the RG Touch library makes it really easy to create oscillators. Uh, and those are the various waveforms. They can be the simple ones like sine wave, square wave, triangle, et cetera. Or they can, we have a whole bunch of really interesting, very complex, beautiful, and nasty, noisy uh, waveforms as well. But if it's just an oscillator, even if it's a beautiful or nasty whatever kind of waveform, it's kind of boring because it's not changing over time. Any actual instrument, um, uh, analog instrument, a uh, mechanical instrument, it changes over time a great deal and it sounds much more interesting than just on with the static sound and then off. So for doing that we have dynamics and I'll have uh, some explanation of dynamics in a bit, but that is what makes the sound super interesting. The oscillators, like I said, can be these simple waveforms or more complicated ones. The dynamics can be some of these and other things. Uh, ADSR is what happens when you um, play a note. Like on a piano keyboard, when you press the key, it goes and then it decay, that's the attack, and then it uh, decays quickly, and then it, as long as you're pushing the button, it sustains and slowly goes down, and then when you let go of the button, it, it uh, goes down to zero rather rapidly. And that's um, one waveform for attack, decay, sustain, release, um, and this is called an envelope for the waveform. You can do much more interesting things with envelopes than that, if you, especially if you want to get nasty noises, but we can muck with the attack to case sustain release. And RG Touch makes that easy. Tremolo is really uh, uh, another waveform, uh, envelope uh, generator, uh, except it's usually constant. Tremolo is changing the volume over time. Uh, and you can change it sinusoidally, so it's like, uh, 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 that wasn't very good. Uh, 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 uh. And um, so the volume gets higher and lower. You can also do it in a square wave, so it's just on, off, on, off. Uh, 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 uh. And you can do other waveforms too, and if you do it really, really fast, faster than the, the, the pitch, then you can get super crazy sounds, and that's really what FM is all about. Um, and uh, it's pretty interesting. Portamento is somewhat similar to tremolo, except it's changing the frequency over time. And it can go much faster or much slower, and if you do it super fast, then you get lots of interesting things too. Um, Actually, uh, I'm sorry, tremolo is in FM. Changing the portamento quickly is what FM is. Um, and then envelopes, you can do lots of very interesting things beyond just um, a, a ADSR and um, tremolo. Uh, you can do all sorts of very interesting waveforms to change the envelope. And then filters, um, like Bass and treble control, people know what those are. Those are high pass and low pass filters, but you can also have band pass filters, only let frequencies through in the middle, and you can mess with those over time, f fast or slow, and you can also have a filter in digital that you can't do in analog, which is just taking values and randomly changing them, and then you get really cool, totally horrible, wonderful noises. And um, I can tell I like noise. I like noise. So, um, and then effects, uh, you can add all of these together and you can have all sorts of interesting effects. That Ones that correlate with the analog world like guitar effects pedals or ones that you just make up on your own. And with RG Touch, I have a bunch of stuff like that. And I make it really easy to add these dynamics just by calling a function. The, um, I wanted to go over how the keyboard works. Um, the keyboard uh, is just pads on the board. These are just pieces of copper from the board, and I coated them with a very thin layer of um, gold so they wouldn't oxidize. But you just touch it, and it plays the note. You can also use the, the keyboard if you program it as a controller rather than playing sounds. You can use it for changing the dynamics of the sound. But the way this works is through capacitance. 
And capacitance are like little teeny, very teeny batteries that charge up really quick and discharge really quick. Everything has capacitance. The pads on the board, these, these pieces of metal on the board, have capacitance. Very little, but it has some. So we can charge those capacitors up, these little teeny batteries, charge them up. They'll charge up really fast, and then we can discharge them fast. If we touch the key, we have capacitance that adds capacitance to the key you're touching. And so that's a bigger, slightly bigger battery, and it charges up a little slower. And we can uh, measure the difference between the charge times. And here's a graph of that. The green one is charging up with just the piece of metal on the board. The red one is charging up with you touching a key. And there's a difference, and we can detect that with a microcontroller so we know which keys we're pressing. Right now, I just have it uh, only one key at a time, but um, I could change that, and I want to change it so we can play uh, polyphonic. The synthesizer itself underneath all of this is polyphonic. We can have lots and lots of voices at once uh, before the microcontroller, which is actually quite low-powered microcontroller. Uh, uh, it makes really amazing sounds for such a low-powered microcontroller. Um, and then the other part of the, the board is the um, amplifier and speaker. And this also has the cheap low-pass filter, which is one capacitor and one resistor per channel. Uh, but the, the chip in here is a really old but still uh, uh, working chip called the LM386. It's a half-watt amplifier chip, and I use the least number of parts possible for it. And I also have a headphone jack so we can have a line out. And I have line in quotes because it's actually too, uh, too high in amplitude, too much volume for line. Uh, to do it for real, I'd have to add another chip in there, an op amp, and I wanted this to be as inexpensive as possible. So, um, but it does work. You can plug that into a nice amplifier and get super nice sound. Um, and the example I played earlier is from, from line out. So, um, yeah, the Arduino library that I made for Ardu Touch has lots of examples. If you go through examples zero through nine, then um, you can learn how to make your own synthesizers with my library. And for example, um, you can make really easily a sawtooth keyboard. So this one, this is the complete synthesizer, including the comments, that's the complete code. It looks quite simple, and uh, following the examples, you can, you can do this, and you can have sawtooth output just by playing the keyboard. You can uh, um, change octaves with the buttons, make it higher, lower octave, and you can change the volume. You can, from there, if you want to, add dynamics. You know, all the things I talked about before, tremolo, portamento, et cetera. And um, here's uh, another demo. Oh, and I do want to say, you don't need my board to use my code. This will work on any Arduino at all. Uh, mine looks like an Arduino Uno, but if you have a more powerful one, then you have more input-output pins. Uh, it'll work on anything. It doesn't come, of course, in a regular Arduino. It doesn't come with a touch keyboard and a little amplifier, but you can easily do that yourself. So, um, but here's a couple more demos. Here's one that's totally different than the one it comes with. But all you need to do to get this one in is using the Arduino environment, Mac OS, Windows, or Linux, um, to down and download one of mine or create one of your own uh, synthesizers and program it in. It takes a few seconds. Um, here's a demo. Call this Mantra. It plays a drone with uh, a drone um, percussion and an Indian-like uh, scale so that you can't play any wrong notes because every note fits with every other note. And all those voices are just played in real time, calculated uh, from wavetables. And um, it's kind of cool. Here's one that's totally different. This one's called Zoid, for you noise lovers in the audience. And it can make lots of different noises, and the, the knobs change the noises. And it goes on for a while. You can play it for a bit. 
um, pressing the keys make different noises. There's also presets to make very different sounds, noises, um, and you can just jam with this. It's, it's pretty, pretty crazy. So that, that gives you an idea of some of that. And you, know, you can't do this with digital, right? So this is purely digital. Uh, with analog, you can't do this. With digital, you can do all sorts of crazy things like this. But like, this sounds almost bell-like. And it's really an accident, because I'm just like doing weird things to the bits to change the sound kind of randomly. And um, yeah, so anyways, that gives you some idea. Um, the RG Touch has a lot of limitations, because it's only a $30 little board with a very low-powered microcontroller. There aren't many input-output pins, so I can't, I only have two LEDs, and I can only have two knobs and two buttons. If I had more input-output pins, I can do lots of things, like add MIDI. I can add uh, a display, I could add a bunch of things, and I want to do that. I have one file in the library, which is for the Arduino Uno. If I use a much more powerful microcontroller, I can just change that one file and add lots more functionality, and I'm working on that now. There's also not much memory. The microcontroller only goes at 16 megahertz. It only has 32K of program memory, so the synthesizers can't be too big. And um, uh, it only has 2K of RAM. Um, you know, so these are all limitations. But if I use something like an STM32 or any kind of ARM core, um, you can have built-in USB. It won't be a kit anymore because the parts are too small for beginners to do, but it can do lots of things with more RAM and built-in USB and have uh, some cooler library functions and have MIDI and all these other things. So look out for that uh, as I have time between travels. All this is available on my GitHub. So um, if you do anything cool, Definitely let me know. Like I said earlier, I'll share it with other people. And um, uh, it's, it's all free. Go for it. And if you like soldering or want any kits, I'm going to be over in the hardware hacking area uh, doing more soldering. And I can teach anyone to solder really well for the rest of your life. So come on by if you want to until they kick us out today. Um, yeah, so that's it for my little rant. Thanks. Okay, we have time for questions. If anybody has any questions. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, what was the purpose of the LEDs on the board? Oh, the LEDs, so the LEDs, um, there's for uh, programming uh, an Arduino, it programs through serial. And so there's an LED for serial in and an LED for serial out. If you're not using the serial for your synthesizer, uh, which some synthesizers I made, you can. You can control it with just a, a dumb terminal uh, and do interesting things or your own um, like controller through serial. But if you're not using that, then the indicators can tell you what mode you're in. Like, um, uh, there's only very few controls on the RG Touch, two knobs and two buttons. So I can um, put the uh, knobs in a different mode. So instead of doing attack and decay, I can have it do change the timbre of the sound and change the volume, uh, for instance. And it, the red light will turn on when you're like that. The blue light will turn on when you're in another mode. Both of them are blinking when you're in a third mode and things like that. It's not the best user interface, but I make use of what I have with an inexpensive low-powered microcontroller. More questions. How do you plan to tackle polyphony? 
polyphony. Yeah. So um, with the low power microcontroller, the max I can have at any given time uh, ind four independent voices before the speed of the microcontroller is a limitation. And then you get glitches, which sometimes are kind of cool if you like noise, but not if you don't want them. So More interested in the detection of pressing multiple buttons. Ah, right. So I just go through each one and I look at this key. Is it being pressed? Yes, no. Look at the next key. Is it being pressed? Yes, no. And that can be put in a small table. And that's going um, much, much quicker than our human timing. And, um, and you won't be able to tell there's any lag at all. So um, it, that's rather really, really slow compared to all the processing going on for generating all the sounds. So that shouldn't be too hard, but um, uh, that I didn't really design the interface uh, with all my Arduino library functions to be able to handle that. So there's going to be some, uh, a bunch of rearranging things to make that happen. That's the hard part. Um, how is it to import uh, your uh, R2Touch library into something like MicroPython? I import to what? I import to something like MicroPython. I think the um, I think the badges have got MicroPython on them. And uh, generally, oh, the the our EMF badges. Yeah. Um, so uh, I haven't had time to look much at the EMF badge, unfortunately. So I don't know what processor it has. If it's Arduino compatible. And there's a board file you can download for the Arduino environment. Then it would be trivial, because okay. um, you just um, might have to change. I, a I think few if things. certainly um, 2016 had MicroPython running on it um, instead of the. Well, I assume it was on top of the Arduino thing, but a lot of people might want to keep MicroPython on there. So just wondering whether you can import a, a, a C include file into, um, uh, into MicroPython? I don't know MicroPython well enough. I, no. I really don't know Python too much. For me, C is a high-level language, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but this is written in C++. Okay, thanks. And uh, so if there's a way to interface C++ with MicroPython, then you can have MicroPython shells uh, a layer on top of it, then you can do lots of interesting things, especially for user interface. Um, you know, the board's microcontroller definitely has a lot more input-output pins and a lot more memory and a lot more speed, so it could be able to do lots of interesting things. And I did notice, um, <laughs> as our Herald uh, pointed out, there's a synthesizer on the badge, but it says, it's not working, <laughs> please check later. Um, uh, so if anyone works on that and gets it working, I'd like to play with it. Um, but that one, I presume, is written in Python. Any more questions? questions? Comments? Yeah, okay. Derision? No comments, yeah. <laughs> um, the synthesizer does work on the oh, yeah, it does. It does, and, uh, it does uh, it make, but it makes an awful noise. <laughs> it's, uh, I enjoyed it, but it was uh, it's, it's painful. I wanted to just do a, uh, one more uh, example here. This one's called our Apology, and it does arpeggios. And you can change the attack and decay. And you can go up and down octaves. And then you can change, uh, here's another mode, and you can see the, the red light turns on. Now I can use the pots to do change the pattern. And I can change the speed. You can make it slow or fast. And, when, and then you can just play with it. And if you want to, you can tell it to play itself. And uh, it has a random number generator in it, so it will never repeat. And it has Bach-like modulations. Modulation in this case meaning changing key in musical. So that's one of the many synthesizer examples that I have available on my website. Um, oh yeah, let me show you where uh, to get the website. So there's my website. If you go to the um, projects tab, 
Then you get my long, horrible page of lots of projects that are all open hardware. And there's this one, and there's lots of stuff, including really good assembly instructions, lots of demo videos, and um, uh, each synthesizer you can download, and the instructions on how to use it are there, including this one and the others I showed, plus some others. Got a question? Yeah, I just wonder how easy would it be to hook up um, a clock input, um, input into it to sync up with other instruments, perhaps? Or was right. that a modification that could be there in that the That would need another input-output pin, and I'm using all of them at the moment. But if you take away some of the functionality, that frees up an uh, input-output pin. One thing that a friend did um, in Croatia, actually, is uh, he took away the touch keyboard which needs one input pin per key, uh, and did a bunch of buttons. And with a bunch of buttons, you can do that with way fewer input-output pins, and that freed up some input-output uh, pins to do other things. And then you can have that sync up to another Touch or another synthesizer. Um, <coughs> just following on from that last question, I was thinking if you do have the serial header exposed, so you've got the serial input, could you not take a MIDI clock in through that without, any other, without having to free up any other pins? Oh, that's an interesting... Um, uh, MIDI really is just RS-232. Yeah. Um, but um, this is an RS-232, it's TTL level. So... Um, uh, with just a little bit of circuitry on the outside converting plus or minus 12 volts into 0 to 5 volts, uh, we should be able to, to add some of that functionality in. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. And also, it's, it's, a, it's a weird baud rate, but this is programmable baud rate, so it's not a problem. <clears throat> okay, cool. If we have any more questions, uh, just quick reminders. So, music amplifies off by 11 tonight. And volunteers for the bar t would be greatly appreciated tonight, especially. And feedback on emfcamp.org slash feedback, I think. But thanks for that again. Thanks very much to Mitch. You're welcome. <laughs>